Today's daf we're going to be learning is the daf for Shabbat. It's Tubo daf Pei Zayin. We're going to start at the Gemara at the bottom of Pei Vav and Mugbet. We saw the Mishnah. We're not going to go into all the details, although as we go on today, we'll quote parts of the Mishnah. But it started with a man who writes into, seemingly into the Ketuba, that Katava Neder Ushvua Enli Alayich. Okay, he says, you don't have to take a Shvua or a Neder or any vows to me. So now, and then we had different languages, whether it included the orphans, it did include the orphans, depending on how he worded it. The Gemara asks, what kind of shvua are we talking about? Rashi explains there would be a case where the woman, say the husband made her chemvanit, okay, he put her in charge of his store, let's say, where he put her in charge of his money. And then, he had some questions and he said, oh, what happened to this money or what happened to that? Then basically she would ask him, you know, he would, I'm sorry, she would have to swear about the tr- the case, okay, well, about whatever had happened. So in the event he makes her an apitropia for his property, then she doesn't have to swear. However, it's implied from there, at least, right, is that Pogemic Tubata, which is going to be the next opinion, if she received that this doesn't have to do at all with her ketubah. When it comes to collecting her ketubah, she would have to swear. To which the Gemara says, brings another opinion. Rav Nachman Amar Rav Rav Ala Ketubata. He says, no, it's about a woman who gets part of her ketubah money back and she needs to swear that she didn't get the rest of it. So he claims that she, that he paid the whole ketubah and she says, no, you only pay me half. In order to get the other half, she has to swear that she didn't, okay, this is what you call, or we'll see, it's kind of like a modebe mikzad. It's like a case where someone claims, okay, modebe mikzad, classic case is, I say, you owe me a hundred, and you say, no, it's true, we had a loan, it's true, you loan me money, but I only owe you 50. So in order to not pay the other, in order to not pay, that person swears, and then doesn't, right, swears that they actually already, paid 50, and then they don't have to pay that 50, they only have to pay the other 50. So according to, again, according to Rav Yehuda, the swearing that she gets out of is but not a case of she would still need to swear. And Rav Nachman Amar Rav says the swearing she gets out of, and Rashi claims that he means also the previous case, and also she can actually get out of it and she wouldn't need to swear. As a Rav Mordechai, Amr the Shmate Kameda Rav Ashi. Rav Mordechai taught this in front of Rav Ashi, and he said the following: Bishlam, I understand the man Amar Pogem Ktubata. De Maskadata Dilma Mitzarche Lezuze Veshakil Namiktubata. I understand that when she stands there at the beginning of their relationship and they're working out the details of the Ktuba, and she says, you know, listen, I prefer. Okay, let's read it inside. But Amr like Chovli Dilo Mishtabat. Promise me that you're not going to make me swear later on. And what scenario would she imagine? She could imagine the scenario where she might have gotten part of her tube money, not all of it. And then she's basically saying, don't make me swear on the rest. But you're saying that's what the Mishnah is talking about. She became responsible for his money in his lifetime. Who would have thought that she would have thought in the beginning of the marriage, oh, maybe he'll put me in charge of his money, to have thought to say to him, Promise me that you won't make me swear. It seems a little bit strange. So Ravashi answers him by saying, You learned this teaching of Rabbi Yehuda in the name of Rab, that it's an Abitropiyash and Asay B'chaye Bala, about what kind of Shmu is he exempting her from, what type of swearing. But we actually learned that line that Rabbi Yehuda said. We learned it that it wasn't on that part of the mission, it was on the last part of the mission, which says, if she goes from the grave of her husband to straight back to her parents' house, or she goes back to her father-in-law's house, but she didn't become in charge of his possessions, they don't make her swear. But but if she became in charge of his money upon his death, then the Yatomim can make her swear. They can function like the husband in the sense that 
they can make her swear about what she did with money from their estate, okay? Which makes sense, right? If she's in charge of the money, they can make her swear about certain things, make sure that she you know, is dealing with them properly. But they can't make her swear about anything that happened before the death of the father. So, or or before, we don't know exactly what before. It's exactly what the Gemara is going to ask. Shaval what, what was there before? So I'm a Rav Yudah Marav, and that Rav Ashi says, Rav Yudah said the name of Rav, it was a case of Pitchop Yishana, say B'chayei Ba'ala, meaning they can't say, if she was, let's say, the father, okay, in, in 2020, the father made her in charge of his property. 2022, he died, right, the husband. 2022, he died. From the death, the children can start making her accountable and make her swear. But they can't go backwards and say, hey, why did you do this in 2021? I see the way you handle the property, you know, you need to swear to us about why that happened and what you did and et cetera. So, you know, where that money's missing, where is it? So they can't bother her about things there. But they can make her swear as soon as the husband dies, even before the burial, about, let's say, handling the burial things. You know, why did you sell your property for such a low price it's just so that you could pay the, the burial costs. They can complain about that and make her swear. Rav Matna disagrees with this point, by the way. He says, Even between the death and the burial, they can't. They can only do it once the burial is over. But until the burial, we all know how stressful that time period is. There's three situations where, since they're desperate situations, one doesn't really have to do with our case. It's food, if you need food to eat, or cargo, which is this tax they put on the heads on a, on a debt, like a death tax. Um, and kfura, or it could be even just any tax. And kfura and burial, you're allowed to sell land without announcing it. That means often if you're desperate to sell money, you'll end up selling property, you'll end up selling it for less than the market value. So if she sells things for less than the market value, then they're not going to be very happy with her. But if it was for the sake of the burial, she has no, right? We allow that kind of thing. And therefore, they can't make her swear on any of her business dealings. She did relating right in between the death and the burial because that's that pressure time where anything she does, we assume that we're not going to be bothering her about them because she was obviously desperate. Now we're going to go back to the language. The language in the Mishnah was, he says to her, I don't have any vows or swears upon you, meaning I won't make you swear or take a vow. What if he said a language that wasn't as clear? Rabbi says in the name of Rabbi Chia, without neder and without swearing, which basically sounds like I won't make you swear, but it doesn't say it as clear. Well, we assume this means He's not going to make her take any shvuot, so he can't. Aval your sheen must be inota, but the ones who inherit the heirs are allowed to make her swear. Niki neder, niki shvua. I want you to be free from neder, free from shvua. Bein hu bein your sheen e must be inota. This is a more general language, which seems to include anyone. Right? I want to absolve you of any shvuot. Dehachi kamerla, because what he really is saying to her minaket mishvuata. Okay, you are free, absolved from any any swearing. Rav Yosef, second opinion. Rav Yosef Amar Rabbi Chia. Notice they both quote in the name of Rabbi Chia. That's so far as the same. Without neder, without shvua, you don't have to do anything. Right? Well, again, he can't make her swear, but the yorshim, the heirs, can because it only related really more to him. It was a more limited. Niki neder, niki shvua. Here comes the big disagreement. Total opposite direction. Bein hu, bein yorshim, must be inota. When he says free from neder or clean from neder, clean from shvua, what he meant to say was that no matter what she has to swear, also to him, also to the yatoman, meaning if there's a, there's a case where she needs to take a shvua, she will have to do it. She's not exempt. Hachi kamala, what he means to say is there might come times where you need to absolve your, your guilt almost, right? Clear your name by swearing. And that's why is not clear which direction you mean it. 
and therefore will be strict and she's allowed, she, he can enforce, she, he can force her basically to take a shvua or an edya. Third opinion. Shalach Rabbi Zakala Mar'uka. He sent to Mar'uka the following. All four of these languages are all the same. It just depends more of what you say. If you said Delo Neder or Delo or Naki Shvua, Naki Neder, Ben with my possessions, then since he specified his possessions, it means only when he's alive. If it goes to his heirs, then no, she has to take. She has to swear. If he says, from these possessions, then he's pointing to the possessions, the items. From that, then this will last forever, basically. His heirs also, she will never have to take a shvuah. Rav Nachman says in the name of Shmua, pay attention to the names. In the name of Abishal ben Ima Miriam, who was a Tana, all of these options that we've seen before, right? Which other, whatever language of Shvua, no neder, clean from Shvua, clean from neder, all that. In my possessions, in these possessions, it doesn't matter. Even he, even the, the heirs do, are not allowed to make her take a Shvua. However, his big but, ava. But the rabbis instituted a takana that goes against this. The rabbis said no one can collect money from orphans unless they swear as a way to protect orphans, which means even though he meant you should be absolved from any shvuot, any nidarim, also from my children, he doesn't have the power to do that. And the takana of the rabbis overrides his wishes. And therefore, we have no choice, but she has to take a shvua if she wants to get her ketuba money from the heirs. To which we have an Ika Amri, another version. Ika Amri Lamat Nita. Some people say that what Abba Shaul was quoted as saying by Rav, by Rav Nachman, who quoted Shmuel, who quoted Abba Shaul, was actually a Braita. And here goes the Braita. It's the exact same thing. Abba Shaul ben Ima Miriam Amal. Ben Delo Shvua, Ben De Naki Shvua, Ben Delo Neder, Ben Naki Neder, Ben Minachasai, Ben Minachasai Ilan. All those languages. Ilan, uh, Ilan. He or the inheritors, the heirs, don't make her swear. But what can I do? But the rabbi said, again, the content is the exact same thing. It's just that he said it. And then, And then we have that Rav Nachman quotes in the name of Shmuel, who was the one who quoted it all before, that we pass in this way. Okay, so those were four different opinions about different languages and what they mean and what the halachic ramifications are. New mission. If she gets part of her ketubah back, she can only demand it back by swearing. Eid echad, right? She can only demand the rest of it. We're going to see these cases much more in detail in the continuation of the mission, so I'm going to explain them all as we get to them. Eid echad mi'idashi po'a. One witness comes and said he, she already got paid back the money. Loti para If she wants to collect her tuba money anyway, she has to swear that she didn't receive anything. If she wants to get it from orphans, his heirs, or from leaned property that was already sold to somebody else. This fanav. And if he's not there, loti para She can only do it by swearing. Now the mesh is going to explain exactly all the details of every case. What would be the case? I talked to Bata Elif Zuz. For example, if Tuba was a thousand Zuz. And he says, the husband says, You already got your Tuba money, I paid you. And she says, I only got a hundred of it, hundred dinarim out of a thousand. Hundred Zuzim, it's the same thing. She needs to swear in order to collect her money. What's the case of one witness? She had a ketubah of a thousand zuz. And he says, you already got your money back. And she says, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't get any money. One witness comes and says, she got paid back the money. Well, one witness is not acceptable in court in general, but it is acceptable in certain cases. And we're going to see where this comes from. 
that she will have to swear in order to get her money. So lo to get her money, she basically has to take us has to swear. He already, the, the husband sent, sold his property to other people. When she goes to collect her tuba, he has no property. So she goes to the other people. She goes to them and says, listen, I'm owed ketuba money and your property is lean to my ketuba. So because how do they know that she didn't get paid her money back? This we know already. He left property to the orphans. Right, he died. And she collects from them. She has to swear because, like we said, this is with anyone who collects from orphans because maybe the father had already paid the money and they have no way of knowing that. So the person has to swear. What about not in front of him? He went abroad. And she tries to collect her tuba money. She goes to the court and says, listen, my husband owes me my tuba money. He's not here. Since he's not there to defend himself and claim maybe she got some of the money back already, so she needs to swear. Last line in the Mishnah, moving now to Amubet, Rabbi Shimon Omel calls Manshi Tovak Tubata. Whenever she demands her Ketuba, Hayorshi must be, you know, the heirs make her swear. Vime not Tovak Tubata, and if she doesn't demand her Ketuba, Hayorshi must be, you it is a very unclear line. Rashi says in the Gemara, we're going to explain on what to what this is this referring and what does it mean. So we'll leave this line for right now. First thing we're going to have is the Pogemic Ketubata. So again, she paid part of her Ketuba. So Savar Rami Barhama Lemeimar Shvua De Olaita, De Kataim Matayin, he claims, I paid you 200. Ve Kamoda Labemea, and she admits, I paid you half, which is really no different than a classic case of Moda Bemixa. Havi Allaho De Abi Mixata Tana. This is a basic halach. If I claim I loaned you 100 and you claimed, listen, you're right. I took out a loan of 100 from you and I owed you 100, but I paid you back 50 already. So in order to be exempt from that 50, you swear and then you're exempt from the 50. So likewise here, she claims she didn't get all the money. So she has to swear she got half the money. And not the, and the, really that she didn't get the other half is what she needs to swear about. She didn't get the other half and therefore she can collect her money. So it sounds like the same thing. It's a known thing that if you do moda b'miksa, Torah law is, you swear. Again, now comes Rava, not again. Now we're going to see. Comes Rava and he says, I take two issues, issues, two issues with what you just said. Chada. Generally, shvua by Torah law, other than a few exceptions to the rule, which we'll see later, are shvuot where you swear and then you're exempt from paying. That, that's what we always say, right? If you want to take money out of someone, you have to prove it. So it's much easier to say, listen, I'm going to swear and not pay you to get out of a payment. That was the case where I say you owe me 100 and you said I only owe you 50. So to get out of paying the first 50, you swear. In this case, she's nishpat v'notelet. She swears to collect money. That's totally different. Okay, in general, the Torah does not issue swearing in order to allow you to collect money from someone. That's already changing hands. We don't normally allow you to do that. Ve'od. And secondly, ein nishpa'in karka'ot. We don't institute swears. Okay, and we, in order to swear, it's usually on movable property. It's not on land. Okay, and there's a on ktuba and shvuot. Masechet shvuot daf mem gimel amubet to mem. Sorry, mem bet amubet to mem gimel. It talks about that you don't make a shvua on land. Okay, they learn it out from sukim. We don't make. So when we talked about shvua, we gave an example of a loan, something like that, or an item that you claim I claim is mine and you claim is yours, right? And then we have a dis disagreement about it. There could be Eid Echad, or actually that's confusing two things, but we're going to see Eid Echad also has these same criteria, any swearing related to one witness also. But in, in any case, the idea here is um, that if there's a mode of a mix up on money or on property that's movable, metal tilling, then you do, uh, you swear by Torah law. But if it's on land, we don't make you swear. Now, the ketubah is 
to, is collected from property and also from lien property. So there is no shvuat mod of a mix up by Torah law on Chirat Shabu Karkaot. He claims, right, I already paid you. And then she says, you didn't. We don't take a shvua on that by Torah law. Therefore, El Amarava, by the way, this entire structure, where Rami Brahama says, I think this is Doraita. Rava comes and says, I take two issues with you claiming that because of these two factors. There's no shvua or modem mitzat on where you collect the money, you swear to collect, and not on land. We're going to have the same structure at the end of today's stuff. So remember, El Amarava. Rava says, Mi de Rabbanan, de paradiek, umifralodiek. Let's explain all this. Rav says what we're talking about here is a shvua by rabbinic law. It's only the rabbi said she, take, she should take a shvua. Really, she can collect her money without a shvua, but we're going to make her collect with a shvua only. Why? Because who is careful? Think about yourself. Okay, If you borrow money or you lend money, what are you going to be more careful about to pay attention to? Usually, it's when you owe money because you it's always weighing on you that you owe this money to someone. So if you pay back the money, you'll likely remember Whereas the person who lends the money less likely remembers. In this case, she, she's the one who's collecting. She might not remember that she got paid her ketuba. Whereas when we're talking about a regular, uh, if she was if she was the one who was paying the money, we would trust her. Here, it's not that we don't trust her because we think she's lying. We just think maybe she doesn't remember because it's less memorable when you have to when you're collecting money than it is when you're paying people back money. One could maybe argue with this, but I could see logic for saying this as well. So the rabbis made a shvua. They said, if you want to collect your money in this case, you already right, pay back part, you got paid back part. We think that you might confuse the rest of it. Therefore, we're going to make you swear in order to get paid back the rest of it. Okay. And that way you'll be more careful about paying attention because you'll know that in order to get back the rest of your money, you're going to need a swear. So you're going to pay very close attention and not make mistakes. Now we're going to have a series of three questions. What if she paid back half her tuba with witnesses? She had witnesses who said it. Do we say the following? If she would have given received the second half, okay? He paid her the tuba money and there were witnesses who saw it. She got back half her money. Now, it doesn't matter, half, any percentage. Now, do we assume? But since we don't have witnesses saying he paid back the rest of it, maybe it's obvious that he didn't pay back. Because in Ita de Para, if she would have paid, if gotten paid back the money, but he didn't have a parley, he would have made sure there were witnesses just like the first time. If there were no witnesses for the first, we don't assume there were witnesses for the second payment. But if there were witnesses for the first payment, if he went that far to make sure there were witnesses, then maybe we can assume there would have been witnesses the second time. The fact that there's no witnesses proves that she clearly didn't get paid back the money, and then maybe she wouldn't need to swear. Or maybe just by chance there happened to be witnesses, so there were witnesses, but it doesn't mean he's only going to pay her back in front of witnesses. To which the Gemara says, Tashma, let's try to learn from here. They quote the following source from Masechet Shavuor. This is what we saw before. All cases of Torah swearing is you swear and then you don't pay. It's to get you out of a payment. But there's a few unique exceptions. These people can swear to collect. Who is it? Hasachir, if you work for someone and they didn't pay you, you can swear that, right? And there's no proof either which way. Usually, you would, the burden of proof will fall on you that you didn't get paid. Well, in this case, we allow you to swear in order to get your money. Vehanigzal, right? It's to make sure also people don't take advantage of them. Nigzal, if money was stolen from you or property was stolen from you and you claim, and the, the robber claims he paid you back and you said, no, you didn't. So you would have to, you could, you could, if you wanted to, swear that you never received the stolen item back and get your money back. Someone caused damage to you, okay? And then you say, she never paid me back for the damage she caused me. And then you swear you can get your damages. Let's say we're having a disagreement, you and me, and the shvu is supposed to be on you. Okay, because it's one of those cases where you don't, you know, you're supposed to get out of a payment. You're supposed to swear. Then you are a person who maybe lied in court once before or swore, swore falsely or some other reason why you're suspect that you might be lying. And therefore, we don't trust you. So we throw the shvua back onto the other person and I can swear in order to collect. And 
There's a bit of a complicated case. It's where I don't have money to pay my workers. I ask a storekeeper to pay my workers for me and I'll pay him back later. Well, it comes later. He says, okay, I paid your workers. Give me the money. The workers come to me and say, we never got paid by the storekeeper. Give us our money. So now somebody is lying, but a fascinating halacha is that both the chemvani and the workers are allowed to swear to me. They can both come and swear, even though if theoretically one of them is definitely lying and say, we never got paid. Or the chemvani says, I paid them and you didn't pay me back. And the workers say the chemvani never paid us and I'll have to pay them both. It's a crazy case. We'll talk about it more when we get to it when that's the topic that we're learning. Here we go. This is the main reason why we quoted the source. If you're wondering why we bring this, if you remember even what question we were up to, I'll remind you in a minute. If I have a star, I loaned you money and I have the document because I hold the document until I get paid back. And then I say, right, I, you gave me back some of the money and we did it without any witnesses. So sounds, right? So then I can swear that, I didn't get the rest of it and collect the money. So now the Gemara says, we can infer from this, if I was pogeim my shtar be'edim, it sounds like I wouldn't be allowed, to, I wouldn't need to swear, okay? So, because why? This was our whole question. If we did it with witnesses, then the assumption is, well, then the second half must be obvious you didn't pay it back because I would have made sure there were witnesses. And that's what we're inferring from here. To which the Gemara says, no, you don't necessarily need to infer that. The unique case to say I can swear and get my money is shaloba edim. Why is that more unique and more of a chidush, as we say? So the Gemara says, or again, this is just an alternative way to read it, which means we don't know which way to read it, which means we're going to end up without an answer to our question. You could read this as not, of course, right? Not even, we didn't even need to tell you the case of pogem shaloba edim that you would need to swear to swear in order to get the rest of the money back. But, right? of course there you need to swear to get your money back. But if there were no witnesses that saw, so I have a star that says you owe me a hundred. And I say, listen, give me back the money. But by the way, even though we don't have witnesses for this, I know you paid me back 50. Now, if I say that, it's only my word that makes you exempt from that first 50. So you might've thought, you might think I'm super believable because I'm basically returning to a lost item because you paid me back the 50. There were no witnesses. It's as if I can claim it easily. So if I come forward with information that's against my best interest and say, oh, listen, you already paid me 50. Maybe we're assuming that I'm telling the truth and therefore for the other 50, I wouldn't even need to take a shvua. To which the Gemara says, Kam Ashwan, that's why you need to teach you specifically the case of without witnesses, because that is a bigger, unique halacha. But even with witnesses, you need to swear, in which case we don't really have an answer to our question because we could read it either which way. Second question, Ibaili. Let's say I get paid back my ketubah in very small installments. And then I bring a list and I said, listen, on September 1st, he paid me 10 cents. And on September 8th, he paid me 15 cents. And on September 9th, he paid me, right? And you basically go through with this very long list of all these teeny little amounts that he paid you that are all less than the value of a pruta. Do we say, me, I'm Rina. And then you basically come with your list and you say that I got paid, but I didn't get paid anymore. Now I look pretty believable there. I have all this calculations and, and details. Does that mean I'm telling the truth? So that's the debate here or the deliberation. Because I was so particular with all the details, I must be speaking truth. Oh, Dilma, or maybe maybe I'm just writing these little teeny amounts to make you try to believe me, and I'm really tricking you. In which case, look at my answers, take who it stands, we don't have an answer. Third question. What if he pulls out the star, it says he owes me 200 Zeus. He says, listen, I already paid you that amount. And I say, what are you talking about? You owe me the money, but it wasn't 200 actually, because we made an agreement, if you remember, and we said it was only 100. So what if that means she diminishes the value of her tuba? She admits to basically the, even though the tuba says X amount, they agreed to less. Remember we had all Mishnah about, could you do this or not? 
Either it's a case where you could, or maybe it's beyond the 200 zoos. It's talking about the extra. Either which way, do we say this is no different than the pogemet? She basically says, I, I admit that you gave me back part, because in a sense, it's very similar. Odilma, or do we say no? Pogemet modi bimitza. Pogemet is different because she does admit to part. In this case, she doesn't admit to getting paid back. She just admits that she's not owed it, but not that she got paid back. Pay back. So Tashma, let's learn from here. Pochetet, here's again a Tanaitic source. If she says it's less, then she gets it without a shvua. Ketzad, how do we know this? Uh, how does this work? What's the case? It was a thousand zoos. And he says, I already gave you the thousand. She says, no. But but it was only a hundred. It wasn't a thousand. She gets it without a shvua. To which the Gemara asks the basic question. So there's our answer. Okay, she doesn't need to swear in that case. But the Gemara questions, but my Gavia, what's she collecting it with? On what basis? What? Because she has a shara that says, I owe you a thousand zoos. That star is false. It's a false document. Because she claims it was only a hundred, and in this document it says a thousand. So I'm a rabba, bereid rabba, beomeret amanai tali beni lebeno. She says, no, no, this is my tuba. But we had an oral agreement between the two of us, and we trusted each other, and that's why, right? Obviously, at some point there was a breach of trust because now they're disagreeing about whether she got the money back or not. But at that point, we had trust between us, and we had just a, a an arrangement between the two of us that I was only going to collect a hundred. So again, in this case, she is believed and she gets to take it without any shvua. Okay, going back to the case of Eid Echad and the Mishnah. Eid Echad mida shipua. Sabar ami barcham ala meimar shvua do raitem. Dekhtiv la yakum Eid Echad bi'ish l'chol avon l'chol chata. Rami Barcham wanted to say the shvua at Eid Echad that she has to take if one witness says she didn't get her, she already got her ktuba money back. If she wants to get her ktuba money, she has to swear that she didn't. That must be Torah law, dekhtiv. Says lo One witness is not going to be good for a person. I can't stand up against a person for any sin or any sin. Okay, another word of saying it. They darsh him from this pursuit. For an avon and chatat, it doesn't work. So you won't get a punishment if one witness comes up against you. Aval kam hu but he can make you take a shvua. Va'amar mar, and it was said about this. If it were a case that were two witnesses to have come, I would be obligated to pay money. So one is enough to basically make me take a shvua. So that's basically here. She's trying to get her money back. She claims, right, I didn't get paid. One witness goes against her and says, you did get paid. She, in order to get her money, swears. But again, Rav is going to say the exact same thing we said above. Two Two issues. One, anyone who swears in the Torah swears to get out of a payment. She's trying to swear to get a payment, to receive a payment. He, nishbad vinotelet, she swears to receive. That's not the same as the Torah law. And again, if there's a there's a, an issue with denying a claim about land, there's no shvua about it. And this is where he claims that he doesn't know where the money, and it's land, not money, that he owes. Ela amarava midarabanan. Rava says this whole shvua that we're talking about here, Eid Echad is a rabbinic. It's not by Torah law for the two reasons he gave. And it's kadela fista to shabal. It's to make the husband feel better. In other words, husband will be worried that the wife will take advantage. She doesn't need to take a shvua. Then, right, and one witness is supporting him. He'll get upset, right? In other words, he thinks that he's really right. So in order to appease him, we basically say, yes, we allow her to get the money, but only if she swears. And that's what the Eid Echad is, but only on a rabbinic level and not on a Torah level. With that, we will end today's staff. We'll continue with the sugya after Shabbat. Wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom. Shavuot.